Hey, I'm Dale. Welcome to Del Basso Timbers. Today is going to be the second instalment in the turning tips from the torso. These are a few little handy hints for those people who are just sort of a little bit on the beginning side of getting into turning. Hope it helps. Okay. A good mate of mine, Big Glenn, and I were talking a few weeks ago, and we were having a bit of a chat about woodworking. He's really keen on woodworking and dabbles a bit in his shed. But we were really talking about what do you actually need to really get started with wood turning. And really, once you've got the lathe, that's only the first half of really what you need. You don't need to go spend a million bucks. You don't need to go and break the bank. But there are a number of things that can be really handy to make your journey a little bit more pleasant and will end up with you being able to achieve some better results with your woodwork. Let's have a bit of a look, hey? Cool. So what will normally come with your lathe when you get it? Generally, you'll end up with a face plate. Now this is what you can screw a bit of wood to, to be able to turn a bowl. That goes onto the headstock of the lathe and screws on. I like to use face plates these days because they're just so much faster and easier for me that uh, little plates like that, and they actually go onto your chuck. That way I don't always have to take the chuck on and off the lathe. Because to me, that's a bit of a pest. Um, the big, big chuck that I've got here, which we'll talk about in a minute, is also pretty heavy, so it's a bit of a pest. The other thing that you'll get with your lathe will be a spur drive. Now, a spur drive goes into the Morse taper that is in your lathe. So you take the chuck off and there's a hole that's in your spindle. Put it in there. Now in my lathe, it's a Morse Taper 2. And with most lathes these days, they are Morse Taper 2s. The other thing that will go on the other end of the lathe, onto the tail stock, which is the windy, windy bit at the other end that you pull it up to secure timber, is one of these. Now this is a live centre. Now the live centre means that this centre part here is on a bearing and turns. That way that when you stick it in the wood, when it turns on this end, it also turns on that end. So you don't get any binding, you don't get any burning, and you don't get any wear marks. It spins all nice and evenly. Got to make sure every now and again that you give those bearings in there a clean out. I'll actually often pull them apart and give them a, uh, a good service sort of every 12 months or so. And I do that when I normally do uh, all the chucks. Just a good habit to get into. So they're the things that normally just come with your lathe as stock standard. All the rest of it, unfortunately, you've got to get yourself. Bugger. Cha-ching. So the most versatile piece of kit that you can actually have for your lathe is the thing that actually holds the wood generally onto the lathe, and that's a chuck. Now these are four jaw chucks. In the old days, you used to be able to get three jaw chucks or four jaw chucks that used to operate independently. Now, my four jaw chuck, this is my big Vicmark 120. You don't need anything as big as this, but it opens and shuts like that. So, so the jaws open, and then they can close again. And that way you can attach timber to your lathe. Now what else will come with your chuck will be a chuck key, like that. Now it might be look a little bit different. Uh, and you'll also generally get a worm screw. Now the worm screw is something that you can put into your lathe and then you can screw a bit of timber onto it. Basically when you're doing a bowl, that type of thing. Generally try and use cross grain when you're doing a worm screw because end grain really doesn't work because it'll just split it. Pretty useful things, but don't use really, really big bits of wood on a worm screw because there will be the chance, particularly if it's big diameter and heavy, that you may end up with actually breaking the timber off the screw 
or it just doesn't quite hold quite well. So I'll be a little tiny bit careful. Now I'm really lucky and also lazy um, in that I've got a variety of different trucks. So my big, my go-to one is normally my big uh, Vicmark 120. I've got a smaller Vicmark 100, which is basically this, exactly the same thing, uh, but just on a smaller level. Um, you do a little bit more smaller stuff with this. I can do really, really big bowls with this. And I've got different size jaws that come with this as well. But these are the standard jaws. These are 50 mil jaws that are on the Vicmark 100. Now, there are lots of different brands of chucks, but make sure you just get one that's decent. Nova does a decent chuck. Not as much of a fan. I got rid of all my Novas, but that's only after I, I got onto Vicmark and I really enjoyed the quality of what they do. They are a lot more expensive, um, and I've got a number of them. Um, in the UK, you can get Record, and I can't quite remember offhand in the States. I think there's one way, and there's a couple of other different types of chucks. But try and find chucks where you know that you can get replacement parts for it. So even things like the little grub screws, even those types of things, and the jaws. Also remember that most of the jaws between different brands, of course, are not interchangeable. So you generally can't swap the jaws between different types of chucks. That's a pain, but that's how manufacturers protect their own brand. Um, the other thing is, I've got another one, which is this one. <laughs> now that one is a Chinese knockoff of the Vicmark. It's as close to it as it possibly could be. I wanted to buy it and try it just to see what it was like. Now it's pretty close, but it's also a hundred bucks cheaper and there's a hundred bucks worth of difference in quality in it. Now to be brutally honest, and I know that it pains a lot of people to hear it and that they will be arguing with me blue and black, uh, but I would rather spend a little bit of the extra money on that or go for something like a Nova. Um, the Chinese knockoffs just aren't quite as good. They don't run as smooth. They're not quite as perfectly balanced. Um, yeah, just a few little bits and pieces that I'm not as much of a fan of. It was worth a try, um, and I do use it every now and again. Normally, I put my um, big cold jaws on, which is what I use big, 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 big jaws that I compress upon a bowl, and that's how I can actually um, clean up the outside of a bowl and make it really smooth and flat if I feel like it. Normally, they live on here. Um, I just needed a double set for a, something couple of weeks ago. All right, hang on, I'll find some more stuff. Hold on. All righty. Now, once we've got the roundy roundy machine and we've got the holdy holdy for the roundy roundy, which is always a good thing, then we've got to do the cutty cutty for the holdy holdy for the roundy roundy. Now, this is where you can disappear down a really, really serious rabbit hole. I'm not going to start the argument about carbide versus traditional tools. I'm a fan of traditional tools, and the only reason that I am is because they're more efficient. At the end of the day, a traditional tool like a gouge is a cutting tool. A carbide tool or a scraper is a scraping tool. It scrapes and tears the fibres. It does not slice the fibres like a gouge or a skew. They are cutting tools. They end up with a far, far more accurate and far smoother surface right from the get-go. Once you learn how to actually master those tools, they're far, far quicker. You may find with carbide you end up with lots of tear out and that you'll end up having to sand a lot more. Now I'm a real you know, hater. Well, I'm not a hater of sanding, but I'm not a big fan of sanding. So if I can actually cut and slice the timber a lot cleaner and have a far cleaner cut, it means that I don't have to start sanding at 80 grit. I can start sanding at 180 grit or 240 grit, and often I do on bowls. I don't need to start to sand under that sort of grit. Sometimes with really great timbers, a lot of the really hard timbers, I won't start sanding until possibly 320 grit uh, because I can get a re really clean cut. Anyway, not going to go down that rabbit hole. 
If at the end of the day you like carbide and you feel safe with carbide, you know what? Knock yourself out and use carbide. I don't care. <laughs> but what do you need? All right. Basically, five things are what you need. Everything else is an additional extra and a bonus and are things that those tool shops and those manufacturers want to sell to you. Now, the basic, basic stuff is you need a bowl gouge. Now, a bowl gouge is what you, of course, turn a bowl with. But I turn 90% of everything that I turn with this bit of weaponry. I do spindle work with this. I do hollowing work with this. It's just about knowing how to control that bevel angle and the presentation of how you present that to the wood. Now, of course, I've got a couple of different sizes of that. I've got a, a bigger one, which is a, uh, it's a European or British half inch. Uh, this one is a <coughs> British or European three eighths. If you're in the States, this, of course, is a half inch, and the one I just showed you is a five eighth. Um, I've got another whopping one over there I use for really, really big stuff when I'm turning outboard on the lathe, um, but I don't use that anywhere near as much. This is my go-to gun. Um, I don't use a roughing gouge because I actually find it's actually far quicker to use this or a skew to rough out spindle work. I never use a roughing gouge because I think they're a waste of money and they actually get a lot of people into trouble really quickly. Right. The next thing when I'm doing all those little fancy finials and other bits and pieces that you see me use, is you see me use a spindle gouge. Now the spindle gouge, if you look at the throat on that gouge, it's nowhere near as deep as the other one. Hang on, let me grab it. If you look at the flute on the bowl gouge, that flute is so, oh, hang on. Go for it, watch out, there we go. That flute is so deep. So that's to get rid of a whole heap of material really quickly, but it's also so that it can hold it in the cup on a bowl, particularly on cross grain work. If you look at that, it's actually really nice and flat. Um, this one I haven't, well, I've swept it back a little tiny bit, but nothing particularly drastic. And I've got it on about a 50 degree angle. Now, I'm not going to start that argument about um, angles and whatever in terms of sharpening because that's going to become your own personal choice. Nothing that I buy directly from a manufacturer I use as is. I always regrind it and I regrind it to the grind and the shape that I like, that suits me. You'll only learn that once you actually start turning a bit and start to get a little bit of a feel of what all of this is about. Right, so that's for spindle stuff. So that's for long stuff. Yep. Now the skew. Don't use this on a bowl. That's not what it's supposed to be for. I do little tiny bits with it on a bowl, maybe on the outside. If I'm using it as a negative rate scraper on the outside of a bowl, possibly to smooth out some stuff if I've got some really punky stuff. But I never do any hollowing of a bowl with this. You will end up with all sorts of freaking drama and no one wants drama like that. Hey, this again is generally for spindle work. Um, I will clean up a blank with this. So I will go from square stock down to uh, a cylinder with this. I will shape this. Uh, and I'll use it for, um, for doing all that fancy flip de dup stuff as well. So this I use as much as I use my uh, spindle gouge. Very, very, very handy tool to use. Um, I might show you a couple of uh, videos time about how this actually works. It's a really, really functional one. And again, this is a small one. Um, I've got them in much larger sizes as well. This is my own personal grind on it, and it's not quite straight across as you can see uh, it's actually got a little tiny bit of a curve on it now that's how i like it to be again you might you it won't you won't get it like this straight from the shop um, i also like with a skew 
is you'll find generally when you get it from the shop, they've got very, very sharp edges along these sides. Now you often use a skew actually angled up like that. Now if you've got these really sharp edges, they're actually gonna duck and grind and dig right into your tool rest. You'll be so annoyed because you're gonna ding up your tool rest, which is a pain, uh, but it'll also stick on your tool rest. So you'll get halfway through a pass and it'll grab and you won't be able to get any further and it'll spit back at you. I always sand off a nice little bevel on all sides of my skew. Just makes it a lot easier to use, it slides a lot easier and it does far less damage to your rest. What else have we got? Now this is a half inch round nose scraper, well three quarter inch. Now I use this a lot for hollowing um, and for doing goblets and that sort of stuff. Um, I, I've got about three or four of them because I've got different grinds on them. So one side I've got it ground around in a, uh, a curve that way, the other one I've got ground the other way, depending on what I'm actually turning and what I'm using it for. Um, I've also got whoop, a big one as well. Now I use that sometimes on the inside of big, big bowls. Sometimes, and you come from the, you come from the middle and you work your way back out around to the outside. Because a bowl gouge will always want to pull away from the wood. A scraper will always want to pull into the wood. So if you keep pulling back out around the bowl, it won't want to try and grab in. If you start pushing in the bowl, it's going to want to grab and it'll catch and it'll throw your piece off the lathe. But yeah, a very handy tool nonetheless. Now that's why I've got that sitting there. You use gouges and you use gouges and you use your favourite gouges. This is a, uh, a really old Sorby when Sorby was still made in the UK and they had really good steel. This is now how short it is. I don't have much fluke there as you can see left. Uh, when you compare that to the other one that I had, which is there, that's how much difference that there is. So this one is about to be retired, but I still use it because sometimes it's got a short handle and it's got a short blade. So it means I can get into really tight areas as well without getting my arms stuck way out here and I don't have anywhere in as much swing room. I can actually do light, nice little tight cuts with this. So I still keep it because it's a handy thing to have. Now the last thing that I've got that is one of the absolute real needs is a parting tool. Now a parting tool is a triangular type tool, like that, and you use it on its edge, like that. And this is what you use to part off timber. So if you're doing spindle work or you're making a vase or all those goblets that I make and I'm wanting to actually cut those off, I'll cut them on an angle, um, but I also need to give myself some relief room. So across this edge, and this one's really thin because I like that, um, I find that really, really useful. But I always make the cut as wide as the blade and another half. So that way I'm not binding up on the wood all the way back here. So if you think about it a little bit like what a riving knife does on a table saw, you use the riving knife behind the blade to keep the timber separate away from the blade. That relief cut does exactly the same thing with this. It actually stops the timber binding on the blade. It will then not kick up like under your chin, which really sucks and that hurts, um, or it won't grab and then bind up or break anything off the lathe. So this is a really, really useful tool. And again, one of the five of the absolute basics. All the other ones that I've got, and look, I could sit here and, oh, yeah, in my drawer there, I reckon I've got, geez, 50 chisels. How many do I really, really use? About six to eight. And some of those are duplicates of the same type of chisels, but just on a different size. Sometimes I use specialist tools like this. So this is a hollowing tool, and that's for really getting into tight, tight holes. So if you see some of those hollow forms that I do that's got a really tight hole or an urn that I do, 
Um, sometimes I use this to get right inside that urn and be able to be able to get in around that corner. I've also got a swan neck that's a little bit of a bend, uh, similar sort of thing. Um, do you need it? Not really. Once you get a bit more advanced, you might decide that you want to do it, but don't bust the bank on that sort of stuff straight away. Hang on, let me find a little bit more stuff. So finally, the last things that I really use all the time is I actually use a really big faceplate. So that one I use for big bowls. Um, and by big bowls, I'm meaning sort of 600 mil plus. I'll use that and I'll use that to turn the outside of the bowl and then I'll make a, uh, a tenon for it, which is an outy belly button. A mortise is an inny belly button, so remember that. Um, but I'll use that for really, really big bowls. Most people aren't gonna use that, that's okay too. Now, I was talking about the live center before that goes in the tailstock, the other end. This is a cone live center. Now if I'm doing sometimes wider stuff, or I just want a point in there so I can get in nice and tight right in there, I use that. And again, that's got a bearing in it, and around it spins, so that spins. Now one of my favorite things is a Jacob's chuck. Oh, let me get my hand out the way. Oh God, if I'd half a hand, it'd, well I do have half a hand. <laughs> if I'd a whole hand, make life a bit easier. So a Jacob's chuck is basically like what you have in your drill. If you've got a chucked drill, this is what will be in it. If you've got a pillar drill, this is what will be in it also, but up that way. Now I prefer to have Jacob's chucks with actually the user chuck key. I never find I can actually just get the, uh, the regular friction chucks tight enough. It's all right for stuff like this, it's got a really small drill bit in it, but if I'm doing big stuff and drilling big stuff in there, like with a drill bit like that, if I'm doing a lamp, for example, or whatever, I need to be able to have this really, really tight because any movement that you have there, or if you're using large Forstner bits, um, anything like that, you want it to be absolutely rock solid. Otherwise, it's gonna catch in the timber and it'll get stuck and then you've got a devil of a job to get it out and you're gonna be swearing like a trooper. I'd pay good money to see it, I really would. It's actually really funny. So I know that's been an awful lot of waffle for ages, but they're really the basics of, uh, of what you need. Hello in the background, I can see you. <laughs> Crikey, it's hard to get good help these days, isn't it? Um, yeah, so they're the types of things that you need. Always remember, as I said right at the very, very start, that a tool shop and a wood turning supplier, they've got walls and walls and walls of the Starship Enterprise of everything frickin' wonderful. Now, that's okay if you've got wonderfully full pockets or pockets that have got no depth to the bottom of them. That's all right, don't care, that's fine. But for most people, and particularly those people who are just starting, really they only need those basic types of things that I was showing. You don't need a Jacob's Chuck, you don't need multiples of tools. Um, start off with those five basic things. Start off with a basic Chuck. In reality, you can actually start off with a faceplate. If you just wanna learn, you can actually sit there, turn a whole bowl off a faceplate if you need to. Just be a little bit careful. Um, you'll end up with some screw holes in the bottom. That's unavoidable. But if you can't afford a chuck, don't think that that's the end of the world. You can still turn. So give it a go. Don't go break in the bank. There is that little bit of a thing of buy once, cry once, meh, whatever. That's a bit wanky as far as I'm concerned. I'm at the point now where I do buy high quality stuff. Um, but I do this all the time, so I need it and I use it and it's paid for itself over and over and over and over. In reality, you should be able to get a setup and a basic kit, a basic chisel kit, a decent one, with a chuck and its bits and pieces and the lathe, in reality for about $1,600 to $1,700 Australian. 
You really don't need much more than that until you're ready. When you're ready, then go and buy little bits at a time. But hey, most of the thing about all this is have fun, enjoy it, don't go busting the bank about it when it's not necessary. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what tool you use, if you sand and if you create a great product, no one who you give that item to at the end of the day actually knows how you make it. All they know that it's freaking gorgeous and that you made it and that your heart and soul is in it. So there you go. That's the turning tip from the torso number two. I really hope it helped. Hey, Big Glenn, thanks for the tip, mate. That was worthwhile doing. Okie dokie. Next time.